John chapter 5, beginning in verse 31, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This is Jesus speaking. If I testify, testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that his testimony to me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. Not that I accept such human testimony. He's talking about John the Baptist there. Not that I accept such human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp. This is John the Baptist. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But I have a testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father has given me to complete, the very works that I am doing, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified on my behalf. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you, because you do not believe him whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. If another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one who alone is God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Today, we have to talk about the most pernicious idol that may exist in Christianity today. Even Jesus can be an idol if you don't understand who he is. Throughout Christian history, we have made things and called them Jesus, and many of them are pagan. Now, Jesus is real. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is enthroned. He is not a myth. He's a man and not just a man. He is the God-man. But much of what passes for Jesus in contemporary Christianity is a false idol created by people. We're going to talk a bit about that today. Jesus is exposing it in Israel. And I think he'll expose it in us. I want to kind of set the stage for our conversation with a passage from Isaiah and I feel like this is beneath Jesus' teachings throughout the Gospel of John. This is Isaiah 29, beginning in verse 13. The Lord said, Because these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is a human commandment learned by rote. So I will again do amazing things with this people. Shocking and amazing. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. Ha! You who hide a plan too deep for the Lord, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? Shall the thing made say of its maker, He did not make me? Or the thing formed say of the one who formed it, He has no understanding? We are living in a time where we think the contemporary church knows better than the prophets and apostles what God really means to say to us. This was true in Israel. And it's what Jesus is confronting. I hope you are convinced as I am as we progress. As we continue to investigate what Jesus insists it means to have faith or trust in him. It's a conversation that began in chapter 3. It's still ongoing. We'll look deeper at Jesus' understanding of the relationship between the Father and the Son, between the Word and the Son, and between faith and the Son. We'll try to distinguish the idol of Jesus from the actual person of Jesus, God in the flesh, who is to be worshipped. Let's look at the relationship between the Father and the Son. Look at verse 31 of John chapter 5. If I testify about myself, Jesus says, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that his testimony to me is true. 
You sent messengers to John the Baptist and he testified to the truth. This is Jesus referring to the story in which John saw Jesus at the baptism. He saw the heavens open and the spirit descend and he heard the word, this is my beloved son. John heard that and what he's saying is, you Jewish folks, you sent messengers to John to find out who I was and John told you. That's what he's talking about there. And he testified to the truth. John told them what he had seen about Jesus not that I accept such human testimony. Jesus is sort of saying, not that I need you to approve of me, but there it is. I say these things so that you may be saved. I'm telling you so that you might believe. I'm telling you so you might know who I am. That's essentially what he's saying. John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But I have a testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father has given me to complete the very works that I am doing testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified on my behalf. You've never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you. How does Jesus know? Because you don't believe him who he has sent. So we're going to begin the sermon to recognize first who Jesus is not. Jesus is not to be separated from the Father. These are not two gods. Jesus has to talk about himself in distinction from the Father. Our Trinitarian theology says that the Son has always been able to be distinguished. You can wrestle that. But he cannot be separated, not even for a second. Everything Jesus does, the Father and the Son do. Everything the Father does, the Son and the Spirit do. Everything the Spirit does, the Father and the Son does. There's no separation between them. And that's what Jesus is saying. So it's very important first, because we're going to move into the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus to the teachings of Moses. We're going to get into that in a moment. And we can't get into that until we are clear. There is no distinction to be made, no separation. There's a distinction, but no separation to be made between the Father and the Son. It is the God who spoke to Abraham who became flesh in the person of Jesus. It is the God who brought the plagues on the Egyptians who became flesh in the person of Jesus. It's the God who brought the flood who became flesh in the person of Jesus. It's the God who anointed David king over Israel and established his household who is the one who became flesh in Jesus. Jesus is not a part of God. He is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in unison together all the time. The Son becomes flesh, but they, he is God. There is no distinction to be made. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is three, one. Until we get this straight, church, we have to, here's the idol that's been set up in Jesus' name. The Father is mean and wrathful and angry and vindictive and violent. The Son is merciful and gracious and kind, and he'll protect you from his mean father. False doctrine. There is no division between the father and the son. Who God is, Jesus is. Who Jesus is, God is. That is it. That's the scriptures. Christians submit to the oneness of God. The same Jesus who said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The same Jesus who said you should love your enemies and forgive those who hurt you is the same God who brought the flood on the sinners in the days of Noah. He's only the God of all creation when he is the God of all creation revealed to us in Scripture. Anything else is a false idol we've made by our own hands and our own editing and our own snipping and our own clipping and our own division and dividing. Israelites had the same problem. I was going to get into it a little bit more than I will. But the reason the Israelites kept worshiping idols, they kept being accused of worshiping Baal, and they kept being accused of worshiping Ashtoreth, is not because they knew they were worshiping these gods. But the thing is that they didn't know they were worshiping an idol. They didn't know that what they were doing was wrong. When you see Moses come down the mountain, and he says to Aaron, What did you do? I was gone for a month. And you have idols in the camp. And Aaron, do you remember his language? You can turn to Exodus 32 and check it. Aaron says, what do you mean? What? We don't have any idols. And Moses says to him, I'm looking at a golden calf. 
And Aaron says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I just told the people to put the gold in the furnace, and this is what came out. I felt inspired to make the cap. And there are many who have crafted idols out of their feelings of being led by the Spirit. But when the Spirit leads you away from the prophets and the apostles and away from the teachings of Jesus, it's an idol every time. But the people of Israel didn't know that. They figure Baal, Yahweh, same thing, right? Different names, same God. So if Baal worship's more fun, then let's worship God the way Baal wo people worship Baal, and we'll just call him Yahweh, and then we'll have the best of both words. Right, God? Better worship. Idolatry. We don't get to worship God any way we want. We worship him the way he's asked. Jesus is an idol when we separate him from the Father. He's also an idol when we separate him from the Word, and we're going to talk about that next. Let's look at the Word and the Son. Look at John 5, verse 39. You search the Scriptures, you Jewish people, and Jesus is one of them. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that testify on my behalf. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you've set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? So here's the first question. When Jesus says, Moses testifies to me, what does he mean? Does he mean that Moses predicts the coming of the Son in the flesh? Is that what he means? That's not right. By me, he means God. Moses wrote about God. Not the Son incarnate. God! Who has become incarnate in the person of the Son. Moses wrote about God. That is the most groundbreaking, earth-shattering revelation for today's Christians that could ever be spoken. And it has been forgotten. Because not only has Jesus, oftentimes in the way we tell the story of the cross, the Father turned his face away. The Father can't be separated from the Son polytheism, masquerading as Christian theology, but you can't turn it anyway. Not only does Jesus become an idol when we separate him from the Father, but he becomes an idol when we separate him from the prophets and the apostles, when we separate him from the context in which he lived and moved. Today, the dominant, dominant belief in a huge swath of Christianity is that the Israelites got God wrong. That the Israelites got God wrong. That somehow what was spoken through Moses was not about God. That we know better who God is. That God would never have condemned the people that the Israelites condemned. That's what goes for theology today. And that is to create an idol out of Jesus. To separate him from who he is. That's what he's saying. Moses wrote about me. Yes, Moses actually did. He didn't get it wrong. He wrote about God, and it points to who God is, and you cannot forsake it and follow Jesus. That's the message. A very famous pastor, becoming increasingly famous, has articulated exactly the problem with Christian theology today, though he means it in earnest, and I put him up as a bad example in this case. His name is Brian Zond. He wrote a, an article called God and Genocide. This is from April 22nd, 2013. And I'm not saying his questions are not important to discuss. There are hard questions. He asked the question, do you believe genocide is ever justifiable? And of course, we would say no. We never kill men, women, and children. And yet, in the book of Samuel, God commanded just that of the people of Israel. Here's the quotation. So if we don't want a God who occasionally commands genocide or a God who is mutating, which means changing, how do we view the Old Testament? And this is his suggestion. And what he articulates here is, in my experience, the predominant view of most American Christians today. Something like this. The Old Testament is the inspired telling of the story of Israel coming to know their God. But it's a process. 
God doesn't mutate, God doesn't change, but Israel's revelation and understanding of God obviously does. Along the way, assumptions are made. One of these assumptions was that Yahweh shares certain violent attributes with the pagan deities of the ancient Near East. These assumptions were inevitable, but wrong. For example, the Hebrew prophets will eventually begin to question the assumption that Yahweh desires blood sacrifice. Jesus was fond of quoting Hosea's bold assertion that Yahweh doesn't want sacrifice, he wants mercy. So let's just say that between the allegedly divine endorsement of genocide and the conquest of Canaan and the Sermon on the Mount, something changes. What changes isn't God, but the degree to which humanity has attained a revelation of the true nature of God. The Old Testament is telling the story of Israel coming to know God, but don't stop, keep going until you get to Jesus, which I do agree you should do. It isn't Joshua, the son of Nun, who gives us the full revelation of God. It's Yeshua of Nazareth. It isn't the warrior poet David who gives us the full revelation of God, but the greater son of David, Jesus Christ. We understand David as a man of his time, but we understand Christ as the exact imprint of God's nature. It's convenient. But the problem is, if we are reading Jesus in such a way that it looks as though he has been divorced from the God of the Old Testament, you are reading Jesus wrong. So here are some examples. The genocide example, of course, is one. Now, I think God did command the Israelites to do that. In any case, here's a little snippet. So, there are folks who say in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, God required certain people to be executed, people who committed adultery, people who engaged in different sorts of sexual sins, and so on and so forth. But Jesus says we should forgive our enemies and love those who persecute us, that we should be gracious to those, that we should eat with tax collectors and sinners, that we should extend forgiveness. So doesn't this essentially mean that Jesus is a very different God than the Old Testament God? Or maybe the Israelites just didn't understand who God really was and Jesus is finally fixing their problems and telling us who he really is. Because how can you have a God who says forgive who at the same time orders killing? How can the two coexist? Here's, here's all I can say. Jesus tells us that the reason the new covenant is able to be gracious, is able to extend mercy to sinners, is because his kingdom is not of this world. Because the kingdom he's establishing is yet to come. But it doesn't take two seconds to read the book of Revelation to know that those who refuse to submit to his lordship eventually will be cast out from that place. It's no different than the Old Testament. It's just that we're living in a time of mercy. When Jesus was establishing a nation, when God, I say Jesus and God interchangeably, was establishing a nation in the Old Testament, it was an actual nation of this earth that needed to prefigure the kingdom of God in the heavens. And so there were actual acts taken. But we don't live in that kingdom. We live in a kingdom yet to come where Jesus will establish those parameters at the final judgment. And so we can afford to be mercy because we're living in a time of grace. It's not the same as saying that Jesus is a pacifist. He most certainly is not, or the book of Revelation is entirely wrong. Judgment will come. No one gets away with anything in the kingdom of God. It's only been delayed. So that's one way to talk about this distinction. The same God who brings the flood is the God who is coming. The same God who brings destruction on the Amalekites is the God who died on the cross for us. We cannot divorce them. Jesus is the same God. And Jesus is coming. It's good news for those who put our faith in him. It's bad news for those who haven't, folks. We know that that's the truth. 